Welcome to the Friday Happy Hour with Victory Strategist, award-winning author and your happy hour host, Anne-Marie Kelly. Each week, Anne-Marie chats with women who have reinvented, started over or wrote fabulous next chapters. They share how they overcame their midlife challenges and how you can too. So kick back with some good happy hour something to drink and enjoy today's show. the Friday Happy Hour with me and Marie Kelly. I'm that recovering good girl and your victorious woman empowerment partner. And this is the place for us victory chicks and you men who care about us meet on Fridays to chat a little bit about ways to get inspired and empowered and to make our lives sparkle. And thanks for joining me at Happy Hour today. I'm glad you're here. And Happy New Year. After weeks of Christmas hubbub, we're finally in our brand new baby year of 2017. And if you're like me, 2016 had its ups and its downs, so join me today in celebrating the ups and letting go of the downs. And did you make any New Year's resolutions? I always, I I don't actually make resolutions, I just set goals for my year. But if you're refreshing an old goal or have a new one or you're finding a new direction, I asked Mary Farr to join us today. Uh, She has an interesting take on what she calls the promise in Plan B. And wherever you are in your goals process today, she has something for you. So Mary's going to join us in just a couple of minutes. I I hope you had good holidays. I did. Um, If I remember at the last Friday happy hour, if you remember, I remember, I'm wondering if you do, that at the last Friday happy hour, Kathy Sikorsky and Teresa Hummel Crowninger were here. But And after the show, they came back to my house here in Westchester for a happy hour. A real happy hour with actual alcohol. And, you know, I see Kathy and Teresa regularly, but a lot of time we're like ships passing in the night. We're, we're business things and we actually had a chance to talk. But that Friday, the 23rd, we just had some fun. And those two are so funny. You know, I poured myself a little scotch and then just relaxed into their fun energy. And I was glad to have that time with both of them. And then the very, we cleaned up that night, and the very next morning, Joseph and I packed our bags and went to Washington, D.C. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, two-thirds of D.C. leaves town at Christmas time, so we got a really good deal in a hotel in a tony little section not far from DuPont Circle. In fact, I'll tell you how tony it is. President Obama will soon be living on the very next street in the Calorama section of Adams Morgan. I tried to guess which one it was. I didn't, you know, because I'm so nosy, I I drove up and down the street. I mean, I I didn't drive. Joseph was driving. We drove up and down probably three or four times to see if we could figure out which one it was. Now, I would have done myself a whole lot of uh, favor if I had just gone on to CNN's website because they have a link and have Every version, probably this when the house was for sale, all the versions of what that house looks like. So, and if you're curious about Obama's new house, the, the Obama's new house, I posted that link and with all the pics on today's radio wrap up. And guess where I had Christmas dinner? Well, you won't guess because it's too absurd. But on Christmas morning, Joseph and I had a lovely brunch in Georgetown at a place called J. Paul's. They, the food was good. The service was good for for Christmas. It was crowded, and they, it was just they did a great job. And then we left there, and we went to the botanical bar- gardens on the you know the, the on the mall, along with everybody else who was still in D.C. Everybody who didn't go away, they were at the botanical gardens. It was so crowded, I could barely move. And okay, this is a little bit snobby. But when you live practically down the street from the world-famous Longwood Gardens, D.C.'s Botanical Gardens is just not that big a deal. So we thought, yeah, this isn't so good. Let's just leave. It was You were getting pushed and shoved, and I hated it. So then we walked around the Capitol building. I took some pictures there and at the National Christmas Tree. And where we didn't go that day but should have was the Kennedy Center. 
But, but wait, before I tell you that, let me tell you about Christmas night. Joseph and I had tickets to go see that movie, La La Land. It's all over the, it's all over. And, you know, if you're watching television, you can't miss the commercials for La La Land. And before the movie, we were a little hungry and had a little time. We didn't want to have dinner because we figured we'd get it after the movie. We just wanted a light bite, just a, 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 something, a little something to tide us over. Well, on the same block as the theater, we found a little basement bar, a funky little place with interesting pictures on exposed, exposed brick walls. And we sat down in a booth and ordered two appetizers. And then we waited 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And we even asked about that delay, and still nothing happened. And then and we were there long enough that we were going to miss the movie. So we got ticked off. I threw some money on the table for the drinks, and we walked out. When we got to the theater, we didn't want junk food, so we just decided we're growing up, so we could wait till after the movie. The La La Land movie was good. If you haven't seen it, it's good, but not as good as all the hype. So if you're thinking about seeing it, save your money and wait till it's on next Netflix. By the, but by the time the movie was over, it was almost midnight. And we drove back to the hotel thinking we'd stop at one of the DuPont Circle restaurants. And I had checked the day before to see to make sure they were open on Christmas. And no, I didn't think to make a reservation. And if I had, I would have known whatever had been open on Christmas was closed by the time we got there. Nothing was open at midnight. And we hadn't eaten since noon. So we were like two lost little lambs driving up and down the streets looking for food. Finally, we found the one place that was still open. And no, it was not a McDonald's. It was a 24-hour subway. Who knew subways were open 24 hours? I didn't. But on Christmas, jeez, was I glad. Joseph had a turkey sub. I had a veggie one. I asked him to put extra cheese. Because why not? It was Christmas. And we took those subway, subway sandwiches back to our hotel's eclectic little teal salon. And in front of the fireplace, we ate our Christmas dinner. It was just the two of us. Well, it's just the two of us because anybody who had any sense had eaten earlier and, and were in bed by then. But Joseph and I having Christmas dinner, having our subways on a little table in front of the fireplace, it was romantic. And and honestly, that subway tasted as good as any Christmas dinner I ever had. And the next day we went to the Kennedy Center. And this is what I want to really tell you. Like the Smithsonian's, the Kennedy Center and the tour are free. The Kennedy Center has three gorgeous concert halls. And each one of them has a special presidential theater box and reception room. And that day, all the rooms were open, which apparently seldom happens because they're all in use or being prepped for use. Well, Joseph and I went, ended up getting a private tour, not because we asked for one, but because nobody else showed up because it was still a holiday in D.C. But what I didn't know and what I most want to share with you is that the Kennedy Center, not only is the tour free and the, the you know, all that stuff free, but they have a, they have every night at six o'clock, they have a free concert. I wish I'd known that on Christmas because they had one on Christmas. That would have been a good place to go, and they had a cafe, and it's open till midnight every night. And there's a terrace that gives you a beautiful panoramic view of the city. And if you ever go to D.C., you go to the museums, all the Smithsonian's that are free, make some time to go to the Kennedy Center. You won't be sorry. Oh, and, and I hope this makes you laugh. I distinguished myself at the Kennedy Center. Uh, Joseph and I and Renee, our tour guide, were in the Opera House Theater. That's the theater that you see. If you watch the Kennedy Center Honors, the Opera House Theater is the theater that the Kennedy Center Honors are in. And the ceiling in that theater has a, has spectacular lights. Well, I couldn't seem to get a good picture of that ceiling. And it was just that spectacular. So I asked Renee if I could lie down on the floor. She just didn't know what to do with me. She said, she said uh, you know, I'm going to pretend I don't see you. I'm just going to turn away. And she did. And I got down on the floor, and I took that picture. And you know what? Even from the floor, I, I didn't get the whole shot. But I posted that on today's radio wrap-up at victoriouswoman.com. And later, Renee told me that in all the years she's been doing tours at the Kennedy Center, I'm the first one to ever take a picture of that magnificent ceiling on my back. 
And then on New Year's Eve, I went to our Performing Arts Center, you know, the one that used to be the Armory, across from the Historical Society. It was the grand opening, and Joseph and I got all decked out, and we went. And we got to poke around all three floors. We danced a little on the stage, and we welcomed 2017 in style. I posted a couple of those pictures on today's radio wrap-up at victoriouswoman.com, too. I think this new Performing Arts Center is going to be a fabulous addition to life in Westchester. And in between Christmas and New Year's, we got home from D.C. on Monday, and on Tuesday I went to Gettysburg. Not to sightsee, though I have to tell you, if if you like Gettysburg and you hate the crowds, this is a great time to go because nobody was there. And that, but sightseeing isn't what I was there. I hadn't been able to work on my new book, and my editor was asking for chapters, so I rented a hotel room. I had to go three hours away, and I spent those three days writing. And I got a couple chapters done. I'm almost finished. I have, I have two chapters left. But I think being in that hotel room with, like, all the germs circulating through the heating system is how I got the cold that landed me in the doctor's office. You probably can hear it. My voice isn't quite – it's a little shaky. But I feel good. But all right, so maybe it wasn't that. It could also have had to do with too much holiday and not enough sleep. But you know, Victory Chicks and you guys, as good as my holidays were, I'm so glad they're over. I love the season, but I'm always really glad when January rolls in and I get back to normal. How about you? Well, now it's time to think about what we're going to do with our brand new baby year. And Mary Farr is here, and she has some ideas. Mary Farr is a pediatric hospital chaplain and healthcare leader, and her book, The Promise in Plan B, came from her years of experience fostering healing, hope, happiness, and humor. Mary's here, and she has some good stuff for you, and and she's going to tell you about her friend Noah. It'll make you laugh. So go get some good happy hour something to drink and come back to talk with me and Mary Farr about the promise in Plan B. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Remember when you wished you had more time for yourself? And now you have it, but you notice you're keeping busy with stuff, but that stuff isn't making you feel happy or filled up. And when you think about what would make you happy and filled up, you get stuck or feel overwhelmed. And then you go back to what's more familiar, more comfortable, even if it's not making you happy. Wouldn't you love to find a way to start making sense of that deep discontent you're feeling? Well, you're not alone. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. And I know there's a place for you, one that other women have found to be both inspirational and empowering. And it's the Victorious Woman Project. Go there now and get on my mailing list where you'll be the first to know about my upcoming online workshops, teleseminars, and more. And while you're there, take a couple minutes to look over my blog. You can download some of the free stuff I have for you and let it get your creative juices going. I'm looking forward to meeting you at the Victorious Woman Project. And that's at www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and I'm here with Mary Farr. Mary, welcome. Well, thank you. How nice to meet you and be here. No, thank you. I'm glad that you are. And Mary, listen, on Monday, I was invited to this luncheon with about a dozen other women, and they were all in that 50 to 70 age, age range, which seems to be like where you're special. That, that seems to be like your niche audience. Mm-hmm. And each of them uh, is it, each of the each woman who was there was an amazing and accomplished woman, and I was honored to be included. Uh, and each of us had some time to talk and you know t- a little bit about where we were in our lives. And the, and what I learned was that if there were a few of the women who are winding down long television careers, and mm-hmm. several other women are making plans to leave careers they've been in, in, in you know law, accounting, and stuff since they got out of college a long time. And a couple mm-hmm. women are newly single. There is one who's newly divorced, newly one who's newly widowed. And as I listened to their stories, I realized that whoever was at that table, in one way or another, they're all working on their plan B. So, Mary, tell me, listeners, what is a plan B? Well, funny you would mention the age group because, actually, uh, I've ended up with some audiences of much younger 
um, women and men, but um, it primarily, I suppose, it's women. Maybe they're more willing to think about some of these things. Mm. But I think what here's what prompted me to write this book. Um, two things. One, I was listening to Ira Glass on This American Life. This was several years ago, and he was talking. He's so zany and strange, and he was talking about going into a room full of 100 people and asked um, how many of you are on your plan A. And, of course, nobody raised his or her hand. Hmm. And I thought, what, a, what an interesting question, because, uh, first of all, I can't think, I don't think I know anybody who's on their plan A. Maybe somebody who, you know, thought he wanted to practice medicine in seventh grade. Um, but it, even that, it, it just seemed like such a rare thing. So it prompted me to want to talk to people and ask them this question, hmm. um, which came up with, a, you know, a whole variety of people in this book and a whole variety of solutions about the Plan B. And, and the Plan B is really just a figure of speech because, you know what, I don't know about you, but I'm way past a Plan B. Um, and it's this whole transition from one to the next that I mm-hmm. think is the most difficult. Um, and then another thing, I had a good friend when I was uh, in training as a chaplain um, who was our supervisor, and he, um, at the end of a long, we'd studied for quite a long time, I had been working with him for almost two years, and he said, you know, well, the thing you have to remember about this job as a chaplain is the job description doesn't really amount to a hill of beans. He said it's all about the interruption. And that it's, wait, somehow, it's all about the interruption? It, it, it's all about the interruption. Huh? That's the most important part. You'll get called. You'll get called in the middle of the night. You'll have things happen. You'll have difficulties that you'll have to help people solve. Um, you'll meet new people, and it will all be about interruptions because your plan for the day, you may have come to work thinking you had a lot of things that you needed to get finished. Chances are that wasn't going to happen. But I think what I learned out of that is the interruptions have sometimes been more interesting than the plans, at least for me. Um, it's taken a long time to figure that out. Mm-hmm. but um, it, And it really just involves how do we make transitions? Do we make them at all? Are we, are we stuck in the ones that feel the most convenient and the most comfortable? It's pretty easy to get stuck there. Mm, um, that's that's you know, really whether, true. Yeah, whether it's the loss of a job or a friendship or... A home, I mean, it doesn't really have to be a terrible thing. It just is something that you weren't necessarily planning on, or maybe you were, but dragged your feet until there was no possible way you could get around making the decision. So it isn't, I don't just think it comes, it doesn't always come naturally. I think sometimes we treat it like a mistake or we didn't manage our expectations very well, and now look where we are. Um, you know, Mary, I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about my very first job. And I was, I, and I taught school, and I taught, I started teaching at 17 in the Catholic oh my school gosh. system. Yeah, I know, uh-huh. I know, I don't know what those nuns were thinking, but, but I was, and I, and. Y- you know that back back in in that time, uh, I expected my pre program was that I would go to school, I would get a job, I would get married, and I'd have children. Mm, I had the same plan. <laughs> yeah, and that's and I, you know I I bucked the uh, pre program because after six years of teaching, I well I'd been engaged and, I, and unengaged, but after six years of teaching, I decided. I want to do something else. So that, so my plan A, I guess you would say, was teaching. But I've had, a, like you, I've had a lot of other plans along the way. Right, right. I, I think most of us do, mm-hmm. but don't ne- don't necessarily think of that. You know, we we kind of think of some traumatic thing that happened that knocked us off the rails, and you know, whether it's a divorce or an illness or something. But mm-hmm. it doesn't have to happen that way. Um, a lot of opportunities come up in our lives. And um, sometimes they're big, big ones, and sometimes they're relatively simple. But how we choose to accept or try that or test the waters or make the transition ends up being in large part our own decision. Hmm. Um, you know, sometimes we get tossed into things that we haven't, we really didn't have any decision about, but not always. Well, but you know what, Mary, that's one of the things that happens this time of the year or at the end of the year, a lot of people lose their jobs. And right. I've been noticing these last few years that several people that I know who have lost jobs get that. Um, it's not you. It's nothing personal. We're right. just going in a different direction, which I've come to understand is code for we want to hire somebody younger and cheaper. Oh sure, but you sure. write in but you write in the promise in Plan B that 
you were told when that happened to you, you were told, well, it's not personal. And you say, well, of course it's personal. It is. It is. Well, it affects all your all kinds of personal things, if nothing else. Um, I, I mean, I, this is a place, this was a terrible job that I had. It was, uh, we, I've often described it as a year of joyless striving. Hmm. But so when it came time that, you know, all of a sudden we're downsizing or we're doing this or this is happening and, oh, gee whiz, I will have to let you go. I actually thank the woman for letting me go. But, you know, within 24 hours, I thought, wait a minute, there were other nice people there that I enjoyed seeing each day. And I had somebody that I had lunch with, and now I'm sitting at home looking out the window thinking, mm-hmm. what the heck am I going to do next? Mm-hmm. And then, then you start, of course, this process of trying to do inter- informational interviews or trying to wade your way into the, into the arena of finding new work. And it's daunting, and it's very personal, and it feels as if, oh, my gosh, if I had done this better, maybe, you know, this wouldn't have happened, or they paid well, I should have just kept my mouth shut and, you know, kept my nose to the grindstone. So it does feel personal, and I think it is personal. It affects your community. But, you know, if you're, uh, if you're accustomed to a routine and seeing people each day, mm-hmm. that's, a big diff- that's a big difference mm-hmm. than working, working at home or trying to find work from home. So, and, um, and it I certainly it affects personal. your income, too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that, you know, is, it can be very frightening and was. Um, but I think in, in the case of that, um, something, I, I, it's a process that I've kind of talked about a little bit when we sort of look at our what we feel our assets are. And, and maybe we've looked at the same old resume for years, but how about looking at that a little differently? Uh, I've done a lot of work in healthcare over the years. But I've never thought of working on contract before, and I found a woman who was delightful, and she took all kinds of people kind of in the, within the range of retirement or, um, you know, people who'd had 20 years' experience at least in healthcare in leadership roles, and she was placing them in contracts. And I thought, you know what, this could really be fun. And besides that, this last job was such a stinker that I got so I could do that. I could have run the country. I got that was so mm. self sufficient, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, and that's exactly what happened. I, I ended up doing this and loving it, and I still am doing it. So, that when, these, when, these so contract, contract work, when you say that you're in a you're someplace for a, a specific period of time. Yep, or mm-hmm. a specific project. Now it happens to be in healthcare, and it happens to be a niche. Um, you know, I may not have wanted to go to work in a hospital every day anymore. But I certainly knew something about business development and about chaplaincy. I knew a lot of aspects of healthcare, and that has um, helped me carve out some interesting niches. Right now, I'm working with a fabulous group uh, in a big healthcare system here in Minnesota who are addressing and intervening on the on the whole problem of physician burnout, which is huge. Well, that brings chaplaincy work and business and marketing mm-hmm. development work into it. So the, the stink pot job um, really left me, you know, hanging and thinking and worrying, but I didn't, uh, I was in no position to just stand still and be stuck. So I think that if we can keep that momentum going and keep our relationships and our sense of community and connection with others in place, that helps a lot because it can feel pretty lonely. And you know, Mary, I want to talk more about that, but we're going to be, um, but we have just a tiny bit of time before we need to go to a break. So before uh-huh. we go to break and talk about the heavy duty stuff, tell mm-hmm. me about your pal Noah Vale. <laughs> Noah, that's really his name. Um, I well, I've had horses all my life, and a couple of years ago, I, this horse has just been a favorite. We all have one. Uh, you know, whether it's a dog or a pet or whatever. And he he was funny from the day I bought him, and I bought him as a two-year-old. Well, I had done so much and had so many kind of wild and crazy things happen in the whole horse world. I thought, you know, what better than maybe to use the horse as a voice and let him develop as uh, humorous, but also let him tangle with some um, things that I think are important. I mean, he even tangled with bullying and talks a lot about friendships. And uh, there's a chapter in that particular book where he's asking the cat what the cat wants for Christmas, and all the cat wants is a Costco box, and he can't figure out why the cat doesn't want a, a t- TV or, uh, you know, video games or something. Anyway, he covers a lot of 
topics that are really pretty adult topics, but he's hysterical. He is funny. He is funny, and I'm trying to, and I'm probably not going to get this right, and I don't have the book right in front of me, but mm-hmm. but I remember, like, he walks into, like, the, you know, the, the, the the feed store to get new hair care products and <laughs> and, and you say, and you write it so well but i think I, like when i was reading that i was like this is too funny it just what i what i thought mary was that those chapters that noah's notes sort of broke uh-huh. up some of the stories because your your whole book is a book of stories of people right. who have gone on to a plan b and then well uh, yeah no it's it's fun too. He's yeah. fun, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it isn't, and I certainly would not be uh, want to be confused with somebody who's dreary and dragging in any possible way. Because I've had a lot of fun, and I I come from a very funny family. And um, your friend Donna Havanaugh asked me to write a little something for a book she's done, and it was about my father, who was you know we had a really lot of funny stuff grew up in our all of us grew up in a home with lots of good humor and fun. Yeah, and so, in one of your stories, you talk about walking, that, that Noah's t- saying that, you, that he calls you madam, and that you're walking into that him and the other horses are playing cards, and then he, then you walk <laughs> in and you know they, you sort of disrupt their card game. But listen, Mary, we have to go for a break, so everybody okay. hang tight, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Are you one of those women who lived the first part of your life as a really good girl? That is, you did all the right things and followed all the so-called rules for women. I was like that too. But have you noticed that once you pass 40, you have less patience for those rules? Maybe you even think that the rules really don't make sense for you anymore. Maybe they never did and you just didn't realize it. Do you want to go where other recovering good girls meet to inspire each other and support their new empowered selves? Then join me, Anne-Marie Kelly, and some very fabulous victorious women. We're on Facebook at The Victorious Woman Project. So go to facebook.com forward slash Victorious Woman Project. I'll talk to you there. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Amory Kelly, and I'm here with Mary Farr, and we're talking about her book, The Promise in Plan B. Mary, you know what? You ask readers a question in The Promise in Plan B, and it's the, it's the same one I ask my Savvy Sizzle and Optimal Living Workshop um, participants, and that is, you ask them, what is success? And then you mm-hmm. take it a little bit further, and you say it's not just success, but heartfelt success. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, when you ask people that question, and before we talk the heartfelt part, when they ask you, what's, when you ask them what success is, what kind of things do they tell you? Well, uh, some of it had, well, some of it has to do with age and how much, you know, how much life somebody has experienced. But I, I will tell you that um, I recently just li- I listened to a TED Talk by a fellow named Robert Waldinger from Harvard, and they have a 79-year-old study in happiness. It's the longest known study in the world. And he had, before he started his talk, he had a room full of millennials, and he asked what they felt was their goal their, for success in life. The first one was to make money, and the second one was to be famous. And then he went on to, to discuss, through this long-term study of 700 men and now their wives since 1938, that that wasn't the case of um, hap- it had nothing to do with happiness. By the time they were done, the poorest of the poor had better social connections, had a, a relatively simpler life. The Harvard students, the young men that they uh, included in the study, were less happy and less fulfilled, and their feeling about success was not a heartfelt one, but probably an external goal-driven one. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would say that that. The difference is between I almost have to ask a person uh, what kind of success I'd like them to talk about because once you get to the heartfelt, then that becomes to the, sort of the, the, the clearer idea of what makes one feel fulfilled and happy and content um, and be centered and grounded and those kinds of things. Uh, external goals, when you really examine them carefully, 
sometimes if you love your work and you're having a great time at it, that's one, that is one thing, but that's not exactly where I meant to go with this. And so when I spoke with people, um, I talked to them a little bit more about this inner process and what had that felt like to them. And once somebody discovered that it had to do with the inner process, it was pretty interesting to see um, what they viewed as success. Does so that make what, sense? So mm-hmm. when you say now, you know, I can tell you this that when that, that when I give this as an assignment, I'm mm-hmm. I, I am I'm not surprised because I've been doing it for a long time. But but I'm mm-hmm. always, I always find it curious that people that many people are more successful than they realize in the oh, things absolutely. that they act, in the things that they actually consider to be success. Yeah, yep. I I totally agree. And, you know, that kind of leads to this whole question about uh, I ask people to review their assets. So when I talk to people, these were a lot of these people I didn't know at all. And I would say, you know, they, they had a big life change. Um, and one woman uh, had written a book called Divorce After Death, and she had made this discovery that her husband had been having lifelong affairs with oh, other that, women. Uh, that's Concha Albert. She's been a guest. Yeah, yeah she's been right, and talked right, about her, right. her book on at Happy Hour. Yep. Well, so and then, and so we talked about that, of course. But then I said, "Tell me what you think your real assets are that have helped you shape a new plan or a plan B or whatever plan it is." And the first thing that came out of her mouth was adaptability. Huh. Well, she had she really had given that some thought at some point, but she hadn't really looked at it as an asset until I asked her. I don't think anyway. Hmm. Um, she had moved. Her family had moved her from Spain as a child at a time in her life when most parents and people would have said, gosh, how could you uproot these kids and haul them off to a foreign country? Well, she loved it, and she thrived. And she thrived in part because she was very adaptable and enjoyed the challenges and the new culture. So that was her, that would have been her uh, asset, but also the discovery that she had more than she even knew. That was uh, that made her capable of making these this kind of a transition I and making it sometimes, later transitions as well. Mary, sometimes I think that we don't that we don't give ourselves enough credit for what some of those kinds of assets. Like mm-hmm. a lot of times, you wouldn't think of adaptability as being an asset, except that if you aren't if you aren't adaptable, yeah. you could have a really hard time. Exactly, and these aren't exactly things that we plop onto our resumes either. That's right. Yes. When, when I finished that, that unpleasant job I just described, I realized, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a little cold thing that's just like yours. Um, I thought to myself, you know what? You are much more resourceful than you realized. And, you know, that kind of gave me the sense of independence that let me go after contracts to work with people I didn't know and to move into institutions and leadership roles that were brand new to me. Because I thought, you know what, I can figure out how to do this. I know who to talk with. I know who. I know where the resources are. So I think we all discover that if we are willing to make make the transition and not just stand with our feet in the mud. Mm. So when you talk about, so we just talked about two things that you talk about in the Promise and Plan mm-hmm. B. One is heartfelt mm-hmm. success, and, and one are uh, re, you ask people to review their assets. So define for me what what heart what you really mean by heartfelt success. I think what I have discovered now. I, I'm just going to use myself as an example, uh, though I I don't really have to because I can think of several of the people I spoke with. Um, I have found myself, um, you know, sometimes you talk about being either human doings or human beings, mm-hmm. Whether are, which one are we? And I think the more I've learned to be a human being rather than a doing, I have felt more successful uh, when I find that I take the time, um, if somebody calls me and they're out of a job, and they're concerned and they have no income and they want to talk to me about the nature of the work that I do, uh, I feel uh, I would never turn them away. I feel like I not only I don't feel just obliged, I feel uh, uh, kind of blessed to be able to spend that time and take that time with them. And as a result of that conversation, 
I would consider that part of a successful, a large part of a successful day. Um, or uh, this whole business of letting go of judgment and and having these kind of polarized, awful feelings that have been flying around for the last, you know, what, couple of years on social media and things that, that make us all uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, if we could kind of take a deep breath and, and go back to um, some more important things than being mad, you know, or, or achieving an external goal or winning. Um, there, there are some other pieces that are so much more, make me feel more successful. I think it's true as well with, um, with others. And I, I'll tell you, one of the fellows I wrote about was a man of great wealth. Um, he, he had a real setback as a young person and ended up in a family business, but his life has been a series of engaging people in need uh, in ways that were wonderfully rewarding for him and for them, uh, whether it was a, an employee who didn't have the money to go to the Mayo Clinic for uh, a diagnosis and a treatment program, or a Sherpa who had helped him on a trip that he hired to come back to this country and work for him, and then he sent the fellow's child to college. He spent a whole lifetime doing that, wow. and he never would never would have been. And he also was a successful businessman. But this was the part, the heartfelt part for him, and continues to be. You know, Mary, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about some of the people who have, uh, some of the people that I that I've encountered in my lifetime who did something for me that wasn't that. I, I don't know exactly how to say this, but they they did something that wasn't like a, a big deal for them, but it meant right. the world to me. And yes. so when I think back about those people, I think, mm-hmm. wow, that was like, like, I don't know that they knew what a difference they made in my life by doing whatever that one thing was. And that's happened to me several times along the way. And and mm-hmm. and sometimes we don't think to tell those people, but I, I if that happened in my life, I would think, oh, that's that's a success. That's a success. Yes. It doesn't pay any money. It doesn't do anything for right. you. But, right. But, you know, you've made a difference in somebody's life. Do you know something very interesting about that very thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the hospital and the group that I'm working with right now is a program called the Bounce Back Program. And it one of the things they have discovered, they're using research and uh, proven methods of delivering a sense of happiness and, and um, success, I guess you'd say. But one of the things that we were asked to do in one of the sessions was to fi- identify a person just like you described, somebody who really made a big difference and I might not have said, taken the time to thank them. And then we were to write a letter. And this is something that they, they've done this over and over and over. And the outcome is this has huge effects on our own sense of well-being, mm-hmm. and it lasts for months. Mm-hmm. It lasts for months. So mm-hmm. you write the letter, and they don't really, nobody really tells you that the next thing you're going to do is either go personally and present the letter or call them by phone and read the letter to them. Well, I'm telling you, that just about brought the house down, but the research around that is huge. The research in terms of long-lasting sense of well-being is these some of these things have been researched so carefully that they even know what the equivalent in taking Prozac would be. Really, and and, yeah, and, and, uh, and I know you know what, Mary. Uh, before right before Thanksgiving, I, I had a guest on who was talking about that, and she called them gratitude letters. They are, and um, yep, that's the very thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they were uh, there's a fellow named Sexton from Duke University who came to our area and introduced this. And it's absolutely amazing. You do it for 10 days to two weeks. Every night you write, oh, there are two different things. Excuse me, I didn't mean to mix them up. But the gratitude letters are part of it. Yes. And, so, and yeah, and, 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 it, and whenever I have done that, and I have done it, where that it just makes me feel, it makes me feel good. First of all, I always feel like that person didn't know what they were doing that was good right. for me. Or maybe right. they didn't know. Or maybe they didn't didn't realize it was as big a deal as it was. So when that happens for me, I think it makes me feel it makes it, well. I feel sort of humble because because I'm yeah. you know acknowledging that and remembering that how grateful I was for doing that. Well, there's a there's an enormous mind body connection in that, and those things are uh, there's lots of research going on at Berkeley, Harvard, Duke, and a number of other places where they know 
that these kind of things make a huge difference in our lives over uh, measurable differences. And there's um, a Prozac connection, huh? Yep, yep. Some of these things last. They have the effect of uh, several weeks to six months of a, a prescription of Prozac. Hmm. Now, I, I'm not kind of able amazing. to give you the ex- exact numbers for Yes, they are. It is amazing. I did one of those letters to my daughter, and you know what she did? She saved it on her phone message. I thought that was so cute. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's very nice. Because but sometimes the, people don't even realize what they're doing. And, and of course, it works the other way. But, but yeah. you know, but we're in, in focusing that thing that makes you feel good and makes somebody else feel good, that's, that gratitude yeah. letter is a big deal. It is. Yeah, well, it's the very thing that, I, that you're talking about, the gratitude letter. Mary, we have to take another break. So, um, so you hang tight and everybody else hang tight, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Hi, this is Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. I trust you're enjoying my conversation with this fabulous, victorious woman. If you're getting inspired with ideas and feeling empowered, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's more for you. Tips, downloads, resources at the Victorious Woman Project. Go to victoriouswoman.com and look around and get on my mailing list so you can be the first to know about the newest good things I have for you. That's www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne Marie Kelly. We're here with Mary Farr. We're talking about our Plan B, and we're talking about all kinds of things that are integral to that Plan B. And you know what, Mary? One of the things you talk about um, is let's let's stop for just a minute and, and go back to the assets thing because I think sometimes we don't think we talked about adaptability and some things. What are some of the other things that are assets that people don't uh, readily think about? Well, let's see. We certainly talk a lot about these days resilience is flying all around. That's a well-used word. Mm-hmm. But, um, I, you know, I think things like creativity, um, self-acceptance, that kind of sense of self-worth, uh, and being able to view oneself that way is certainly an asset because I think many, and particularly women, are likely to forget to view themselves that way. Mm. Um, uh, the capacity to forgive. Um, I, I mean, I mean, we've all known people who've been angry and hurt for years and years and just can't seem to move out of that or, or replace whatever was lost or mm. disrupted. Um, so I, I think the, the uh, capacity to say yes. Um, I, I've talked to... Um, a uh, <laughs> number of people who talk about, well, let's see, the older I get, the more, I, you know, life seems to get a little smaller. And, and, you know, we live in Minnesota where it's cold and freezing and dark by 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And so who wants to go out? And I'm staying home. And I'm just, well, anyway, um, I realize that, that that, too, is kind of part of making life smaller. So anyway, my sister-in-law called me some time ago, and um, she said, well, it's Friday, you know, what did you, do you have something planned? You got something planned for the weekend or do you just plan to stay home and make clothes for the cat? <laughs> I thought, I, no, wait a minute, this is pathetic. I, you know, I just can't, I, to let my life, then I started looking at this whole idea of making, letting, not making life smaller, but allowing it to become smaller. To become smaller. smaller, you're right. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to do. It, it's simpler. Uh, it's, you know, I, I don't have to. I can sit here in my pajamas at 7 o'clock at night if I want. I don't have to go anywhere or have anybody over for dinner. Or, darn, that kind of cuts down on friendships and connection to others and lots of other things. Well, you talk about that. I think it's the first story in the Promise and Plan B about, is, it, is her name Florence? Am I saying the right thing? Yeah. Yes, or, or Flossie, she called herself. Yes, yeah, Florence. Mm-hmm. And she, yep. she became a widow and then just sequestered herself in her, on her farm. It was amazing. It was, and probably the most amazing part was that I actually was able to meet her. Most people were were afraid of her. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, she was a funny little gnome and and marched around in strange clothes, old like old house dress with holes in it. And um, so the story was kind of funny because my horse was so frightened of her that he just literally ran off. But um, she was completely stuck in her previous life. And, you know, she was really kind of a capable person. 
So it was hard to know what crushed her so. Something had. There was a deep hurt involved. Um, and I don't know whether she thought her husband was unfaithful. She would talk that way. But she was also quite a bit older when I met her. Um, and she'd been spending a lot of time talking to nobody but herself. You know, so it was hard for me to kind of figure out what had gone really wrong. But she really had absolutely no interest in reconnecting with, with really anybody. It was just a total fluke. And she lived that way for a long time. Mm. People would bring her food and groceries and, um, you know, try to take care of her. She didn't even have, I don't even think she had a proper furnace. I think she heated her house with a wood stove. and She was kind of squatting on the property on which they lived when her husband had been alive. And they worked on a farm. Uh, so, you know, they were in a rural area where not just everybody would notice them or notice her. But that was one of the strangest things. But, you know, there was something kind of seductive about it. It was when I met her, it was at a time when I had been divorced and I had little kids and there were a lot of responsibilities looming. And, you know, there was a little part of me that looked at that and thought, whoa, I don't know, I think maybe I could... Maybe I could live this way, you know, just sort of. <laughs> I, I, I know. Well, you know, a couple of years ago, two years ago, in fact, I had a, a, a rotator cuff repaired, and I was at a commission. I, I slept in a recliner for three months, and <laughs> and it, and I spent and I didn't go out during the day, so I spent the whole the whole most of the winter in yoga pants and a and a cami and a, and a sweater. And I was telling somebody that, and I didn't, and it was not a good. Ex- I didn't have a bad experience with that, but it was just the process of how it was. And I was telling somebody, uh, you know, like, oh, I'm so glad to get my winter clothes out this year. This was last year because uh-huh. it was the year before I spent the winter in yoga pants and a cami and a sweater. And she said, wow, I could really go for that. And I was like, no, you wouldn't. Not for oh, three months. Right. It's really yeah. funny how sometimes pe- things seem to be something. And, and, yes, when you're busy and you're running crazy, then... You know, like mm-hmm. then to, to live like that for three months and watch TV, which is kind of what I yeah. did for three months, yeah. um, you know, yeah. can seem sort of seductive. I know. Even now, people will say to me, I work a lot at home, um, which is fine because my client is about an hour and 15 minutes away. But uh, I still, you know, if I spend a couple of three days at home, I've just written a long article that took me, you know, a good part of the, of the week. And um I thought, yikes, I need to go do something. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, first of all, I can't stand to look at myself in the mirror. And secondly, I I feel like, I, you know, we need the presence of friends and conversation and things that seem simple but are really important. This whole sense of idea of community is really important. Social connections right now have become um, a great uh, source of loneliness, and that's uh, something that, this project that we're working on is looking at, you know, a lot of the organizations, my mother belonged to a hospital auxiliary and she had friends that she sang in a, a woman's chorus and a lot of things that brought people together. Uh, granted, they were housewives and they were worked at home uh, or, you know, spent their times and didn't, didn't go out to work is what I'm trying to say. But still the idea of having those social connections is really important and the number of people who who uh, report and describe themselves as being lonely and isolated is enormous today. And and you know what, Mary? I think sometimes in in, in the Promise and Plan B, you also talk about resistance. And 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 I think sometimes when you get to this point of life, and some things happen, and 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 you say, oh, I'm just going to stay home. And especially, I'm thinking, yeah. you know, if you've lost a spouse, or you've lost a partner, right. or you've lost a job, then you just like sequester yourself. It, like in a room in your house, you know, right. in, right. in sec- yeah. so, And how do we get better at that? With that whole thing of, of resistance, how do we get better at, um, you know, you're right, it can be seductive, but how do you get better? How do you push yourself out? What do you do to be less resistant or non-resistant? Well, a couple of things I can think of. Um, you know, if, if we're really willing to kind of look at our assets, um, for example, I happen to love I really love to cook, but I'm kind of like my mother. We always kind of in our household, it wasn't, um, I I looked at what I thought was going to be a a diary of hers. In fact, I blogged about it not long ago, and here it was full of of parties, but parties with 
exactly what they had to eat and how long she cooked it. Mm-hmm. And Helene sat here and Bob came there and we played cards, poker. Uh, and so it, the whole, she had two diaries and it was all about hospitality. So, and so we grew up in that that kind of, uh, not everybody grows up in that kind of environment, but we did. And so I realized how much I enjoy cooking and ha- preparing food. So my next step in, in a case like that would be, you know, I'm going to have a half dozen people over for dinner. Maybe don't feel like it so much, but I like the cooking part. So let's see if I can't do this. So I think it's identifying what you really do like, um, going up to the Gunflint Trail, which is the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. Some people, um, you may have even heard of it. Beautiful, beautiful area. Not everybody likes that kind of wilderness, but some of us do. And those are wonderful short trips. You know, maybe I can't, I can't afford to go to Florida for a couple of weeks in the winter or a month or whatever. But we could probably get in the car and pack up the pets and take a couple of friends and go up and cross country ski. Mm-hmm. So maybe just identifying simple little things and then taking that extra step. I have a friend who really likes to do fun and simple things. That's the friend I'm going to call. Maybe we could just do nothing but, you know, go for lunch or what. But I think making it simple, not try to go out and change the world with some new activity. You know, Mm -hmm. don't have to learn how to speak French. And I don't, (laughs) you know, there there are a lot of things I don't have to do, but I could kind of identify parts of things that I already like to do and then somebody who might like to do it with me, you know, keeping it kind of simple. Mm. I think that helps ease out of the stuckness. And Mary, you have really good insights, and and you share a lot of them in the Promise and Plan B. And I know, and on today's radio wrap up at victoriouswoman dot com, I put all of your information and a link to your book. Oh, wonderful! Thank you. So, so it's, and thank you so much for coming. Oh, I'd love to hear from people too. Please oh, that's feel great. Free yeah, to yeah. Email me. Yeah. Yeah. I'd your website to. is on the radio wrap up, and and a link to uh, the Promise and Plan B. Well, and I'm coming your way in the spring, so maybe we can even meet. I'll I would love that. That. that would be awesome. Good, good. I'm planning to in May, so I hope to see you then. Oh, that would be great, Mary. Thank you. Oh, thanks okay, for having you have me. have a good I appreciate weekend. It. Mm-hmm. You too. Bye bye. Well, Victory Chicks and you guys, we're wrapping up the first Friday happy hour of the new year. And thank you so much for joining me. I'm glad you do. And it's especially when I run into one of you, like Claire, who I recently met walking in the park um, on one of our mild to winter days. If you're listening, Claire, we, I'm glad we shared that walk. I don't know if I would have gone another lap by myself. And you were fun to walk with. So thank you. And to all of you, Victory Chicks and you guys, Happy New Year. May this year bring you good health and fill you with the kind of happiness and joy that when the yucky things happen, they get smoothed over and all you remember is the good stuff. I have a, my quote for today is from Mary Farr's book. It's the last sentence, last paragraph in her book, The Promise in Plan B. And she says, it is the journey, the exodus from the old self to the new that empowers us to explore life challenge life, make friends with life, poke fun at life, and finally, with courage and good humor, travel the path that moves us closer to becoming the person we were meant to be, to live life, live the life that wants to live in us. Now, Victory Chicks and you guys, that's a good way to welcome the new year, isn't it? Ready to live the life that wants to live in us. I posted that quote on today's radio wrap-up at victoriouswoman.com. Have a fabulous week, and let's get together again at the next Friday Happy Hour. Jen's on. Thanks for listening to this Friday Happy Hour. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review today's show. And join us again next week for the Friday Happy Hour with Anne-Marie Kelly.